more time. Let's just get straight into it. England 2, Denmark 1. England are going to the finals. To the finals of Euro 2020 or Euro 2021. But regardless, right? It's maybe, finally, after all the hype, after all the um, forced dawns, maybe it's finally coming home. Maybe finally, England are going to be able to claim a major international trophy since what? what was the last one we won 1966 many many years in between then and now don't ask me to calculate i'm not that smart but jesus christ we're finally in a final i think this might be the first final in probably since 66 i'm not gonna lie right i can't remember the last time we're gonna have been in an actual final i remember the few quarters a few semis but i can't remember a final and we're facing italy in the euro final having beaten denmark 2-1 and what a great performance like first of all forget all the hype but as a performance from a team that's everything you ask for england haven't even conceded a goal i don't think so far in euros the first goal that we concede is a direct free kick which i don't think has been scored in the entirety of the euros thus far it's pretty splendid goal but then when you watch it on a replay pickford made a mistake so if ever there was a game that would maybe show you what this england team are really about this would be it pickford had to pick himself up the defenders had to pick themselves up the midfielders everyone had to pick themselves up and find out a way to get back into the game and also to turn this result around and you know, we kept on pushing, we kept on probing, we had probably the better chances, I'd say, even though Denmark did look quite dangerous on a break, I still thought overall England did look like they were putting together, or they were kind of, you know, um, causing Denmark more problems than the other way around, but I still did think that maybe, even Denmark didn't really have any standout players, like really players that could hurt us individually, they still had what you'd feel like a very um which is probably why they got to the semi-finals in the most part right and um, they're greater than the sum of their parts right as a team they just function really well and on the counter the way that they will be able to interchange and knock the ball one or two passes and get it really quickly up the pitch was really good to watch especially for again for a team that doesn't really have any real standout stars in their team everyone really kind of um fits together really well but for some reason somehow Inga managed to dig deep in his managed to weather the storm managed to get a little bit of confidence going manage to play the right balls keep on stretching the pitch left and right a lot of kind of really what it felt like at the time safe passing but a lot of kind of confidence building for the midfielders for the defenders to get onto the ball fullbacks were getting up a bit maybe a bit too much in the first half but for the most part it was a great team performance and then just before half time we managed to get a goal and that was again Obviously, it's an own goal um, by Simon Kerr from AC Milan. But prior to that, Sterling did have a pretty decent chance that he probably should have scored. He hit it directly at Casper Schmeichel. And that's probably been one of kind of... That was more of a classic Sterling situation that you probably would have seen him do at Man City numerous times. But just the way that Man City play and the way that Pep has Man City playing they generally end up creating so many chances that people forget the amount of chances that most of their strikers, people like, you know, Sterling included, miss on a game-by-game -game basis. So you're thinking to yourself, damn, you know, England are Man City, we're not going to create a ton of chances, you would imagine, not probably to the same, you know, um, level of output as a Man City. But then as soon as he misses that chance, we get a second chance. Saka makes a great run, you know, off the, off the last defender into the box. I forgot who cuts the ball into him. He ends up crossing the ball into the box and then in the in the struggle to get back and clear his line, Simon Kerr inadvertently kind of hits the ball back into his net and we're 1-1 just before half time, which is perfect. I guess, you know, from so far what you've seen in the Euros, especially when you're facing teams that have kind of gotten, um, I won't say a lucky break, but teams that have kind of got a goal fortuitously, you want to hit them back, you want to get back at them as soon as possible, yeah, preferably before the half has ended, so they don't start kind of hunkering down and defending for their lives, because the game would be completely different if we went into the second half 1-0 down, but the fact that we went 1-1, we kind of re the wrongs, we started again, we reset, it allowed us to kind of come out in the second half and be a little bit more expressive, and we started the second half really well too, I felt like, um, I feel like Gareth Southgate's substitutions were perfect. I felt like the team responded very well. I felt like even though Pickford had some really shaky moments, he managed to hold it together until the end of the match because maybe I'm being too pessimistic, but you always feel as if there's a mistake in an England team or there's going to be a lapse in concentration. But it feels like with this unit or this collection of players we have at the moment, if they do make a mistake, they seem to have the minerals 
and whatever it may whatever else it is in order to kind of gather themselves and kind of hold it together until the end of the or the until the end of the half until the end of the game they seem to just be able to kind of just be able to hunker down and make it work and i think other teams somehow times you know if they get like a if there was a red card if someone gave away a penalty a free kick suddenly the game will just slowly but surely unravel but this team seems to be able to hold it together and that is i think essentially what led us to victory because by and large was the football amazing probably not but in terms of the character and the determination and more important the luck that's needed to win a game like this we got it and the goal the second goal which was a penalty that um Raheem sterling won again Raheem sterling probably deserves an mvp award for what he's done f um for england during this tournament he's really showed up and showed he really showed up and showed out yeah showed up whatever that term is right um <laughs> And especially when you consider how disappointing of a Premier League campaign he's coming off the back of, right? Um, having been benched for the last few games of the season and it's clearly looking like Pep Guardiola is basically um, planning for a future without Raheem Sterling as being one of the main components of his side going forward. He definitely did come into this tournament maybe thinking, maybe kind of, you know, there's a lot of hype around Sancho, a lot of kind of hype around Grealish. And people kind of forgot about what Sterling does for this England team, especially when he puts the England jersey on and he kind of reminded everybody. And he was instrumental in getting England over the line and his driving runs and, you know, even to win the penalty, he just decided to just pick up the ball and start running into the box and fishing for somebody to stick out their leg, hoping somebody kind of takes him down. And we get a penalty and luckily that ended up happening. Um, the penalty itself, to be completely honest, I'm going to say it was a bit fortuitous. And at this level, if playing a semi-final at the Euros, if the referee isn't sure it's a penalty, you surely have to look at the screen. Right, it surely has to go to VAR, and VAR may have to tell the referee to kind of double check it and make sure he's doubly, doubly sure. Because of, um, I know there's a clear and obvious error thing, whatever it may be, but surely at this level, at this stage in the competition, the referee or Denmark especially deserve the referee just to kind of double check his decision, double check his work, and make sure, okay, cool, did I see what I saw? And if he did interpret, because I think some people are saying that maybe it wasn't the first foul. As Sterling is diving into the box, it's not the trip, it's actually the kind of shoulder or hit barge that he gets just as he's falling down. That's what um, the referee gave it as a penalty. But then if you're looking at the replay, you'd see that Sterling isn't in control of the ball after the first kind of trip or phantom trip. So to give a foul for the hip bump when he's not in control of the ball is a bit weird. But again, um, I think at this level of football, again, you need this kind of luck in order to kind of get through, in order to kind of give yourself a chance to win. And, you know, again, the luck is there. We have to take the chances. We got a penalty, but there's no guarantee we're going to score it. And Harry Kane takes a pretty shit penalty for the most part. Um, Kasper Schmeichel probably feels a bit disappointed that he saved it and it sort of like popped out in front instead of popping out to the side. He kind of tried to grab it and it kind of just popped off his stomach. And then inadvertently kind of ran back into Harry Kane's path and then he didn't make any mistakes on the rebound. And then 2-1, you kind of felt as if the game was over. You kind of felt as if, again, um, outside of um, Damsgaard's amazing free kick, I don't think Denmark had any other real clear-cut chances on goal. I think they had a couple of shots. If I'm, yeah, it says here, look at the stats. Um, England's 20 shots to Denmark's six. We had 10 shots on target and Denmark had three. So it obviously proves that they wasn't much of a goal for it. I think there was a couple of long-range shots Denmark had in the first half, but they didn't really pull us apart and create any big chances. I think, um, what's his face? The striker in the second half had a pretty decent one-two um, exchange with Braithwaite. Dolberg he had a pretty good one-two exchange with Braithwaite with, um, outside the box. That was a pretty decent opening for them. But for the most part, as soon as England scored that second goal, you knew the game was completely over. And... Um, this England team is so mature now, is so together and knows what they're doing that they were able to kind of hold on to the ball, if I'm not mistaken, in the second half of extra time for like four minutes without Denmark getting a sniff. We're able to kind of just, you know, kill the game off. Those was, was occasions where Phil Foden was like screaming for people to play him into the box so he can score a goal, which is great to see. But I think the message got kind of through to him towards the end that, hey, we're just going to play this game out and just be professional and make no mistake that we're going to get through. And they did it eventually. And it's just incredible to see an England team in a semi-final keeping the ball and kind of playing out the clock it's like wow look look what's happened look what's look what's occurred um again props to Southgate 
Um, again, I wasn't the biggest fan of his to begin with. Um, I still probably think he's probably not a top, top level coach, but what he's been able to do with this group of players, um, the connection he has with the players, the fans, um, everything around this England team is completely different to other England teams that have come before it, even ones that are probably more individually talented. There's some sort of weird collectiveness around them and camaraderie and just love and appreciation, even for the players that are not playing. You just see that they're all kind of pulling in the same direction i think that generally does come through on the pitch um the fans seem to be really up for it maybe it's partly due to covid and the fact that we haven't been you know living our normal day-to-day -day lives for the past 16 months but something's happening i don't know what it is but something is definitely happening and the players are responding and again it, the, it's, it's up to the players still on the pitch the fans can do what they want southgate can do what he wants but the fans have to, the players have to go out there and perform and so far every time those players cross the line no one's disappointing each other. They're not letting anyone down. Do you know what I mean? They're all trying to put their best foot forward. Yes, someone might make a mistake, but not. I'm, I don't see anybody hiding. I don't see anybody kind of, you know, thinking about their holidays. Sometimes you'd watch an Incan team, you watch them, you know, they're losing and, they, you know, obviously I'm going to come back into the game and you could quite clearly see some of them just like deciding, you know what, I'm not going to make any more mistakes. I don't want anyone to talk about me in the papers or I'm already thinking about my holiday or whatever. They're completely tapped out of everything that's going on in the picture. And with these players, it seems that they sort of enjoy they enjoy, they relish the responsibility, they relish the pressure, they relish everything about putting on that really heavy jersey, um, which is the, the England top. And, you know, you could see that on, you know, Phil Foden's face as Harry Kane is running off to celebrate the joy, the jubilation. You know what I mean? He's just like, these guys proper, proper enjoy playing for England. And it's, it's been amazing to see because you didn't really see that before. It was something that was, again, I think Rio Ferdinand spoke about before on his YouTube channel about how tribal the england setup used to be and you know for due to club loyalty certain players from certain teams wouldn't talk to each other and all this stuff it was really weird now we've got for some reason we've got a real good collective spirit and it's helping us get us over the line but still the players when the quality is needed on the day they are definitely stepping up and you can only praise them um to be to put a kind of to talk about maybe some negatives the only negatives what i would say are the performance so far would be pickford of course he still looks shaky um he doesn't really kind of fill you with any sort of trust not trust but he doesn't necessarily fill you with any sort of calmness he has a whole bag of nerves and i think that does have a way of trickling into the defense i think the couple of shaky moments that he had in the first and second half with some of his clearances um generally put um it generally made Maguire and Stones a bit nervy but then I also think they weren't really getting adequate enough cover from Shaw and Kyle Walker either so they will kind of be left exposed um that's only one slight thing I'd say I would say maybe who else was maybe a bit of a negative in the team overall um Kane first half was maybe a bit quiet but again he wasn't giving the ball too often as soon as you started getting on the ball more in the second half and then extra time you started to see his quality his hold up play winning of the free kicks um that was fairly good and good link up play outside of the area here and there Sterling of course was fantastic what negatives can I think of the greedy substitution was a weird one and then to sub him again an extra time that was odd uh maybe Southgate should have thought a bit more about you know, maybe bring another defensive play in the first place and maybe not bring it on Greedy straight away. I don't really know, but that was a bit of a strange sub. Um, but apart from that, there's not really much to, to kind of pick apart from. Again, it's just good to see an England team finally kind of doing what most fans think they can do, right? Especially given the run of games that we've had. Um, it's no coincidence that the first kind of decent side that we face in the Euros in Denmark, um, they kind of gave us a bit of a worry, right? They scored first. Um, they look dangerous on the counter, blah, blah, blah. And I'm sure the, it, the games in Italy is going to be far tougher. And if there's one team that can resoundingly kind of trouble England, especially now in the final, it's definitely going to be Italy. I think Italy are strong, strong favourites. Um, they look incredible. They've been tested by just about every type of team. And they've kind of flied, kind of passed the test with flying colours. So it's, England are definitely going to have to be on their A game to win that. But given the run, you know, England would have really did themselves a disservice if they didn't get to the semi-finals at least. And now we've got here and now we've got to a final. <sighs> it's a cup competition. It's a one-off game. You never know what's going to happen. Again, Italy are the strong favourites. I've really enjoyed watching them play. I've watched basically every single match of theirs live. Um, they're incredibly impressive. They have a strong bench. They play great football. Um, everyone's comfortable and technically proficient. 
they have a lot of tactical and you know tactical fluidity um they're again a well defensively drilled team you know that's to be expected they have all the attack and flair to really hurt teams um finishing ability penalties they have no problem with like there's a lot of um tools that they have in their arsenal but again us like england shouldn't fear them it's a one-off game you never know what's going to happen i'm just happy to see fans in the streets people beeping their horns outside my flat just being happy and excited and just you know ha ha it's good to see people having a smile on their face considering how crappy the last 16 months or so have been so again england two denmark one england are through to the finals of euro 2020 and wow can't wait until sunday man can't wait until sunday